Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, and we can see your screen. The floor is all yours. Please proceed with the presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing the screen with me, and uh, good day, everyone. And I'm very uh, glad to be invited by, by your institute to share this presentation with you. And as you said before, we've been helping, uh, especially SMEs from all over the world, to get connected to global value chains. And that's what we're going to be uh, sharing today, actually how to do it, how to, how to not waste your budget, how to not waste your, your time while trying to chase those qualified buyers that we're trying to look for. So, so uh, get, getting started with this, this is uh, the, the outline that we're going to cover today. We're going to go through the objective of this seminar, then how to find our national business opportunities for suppliers, then integrating the stages of the full commercial process, how to identify the right potential buyers, and then the most important thing, how to integrate the right value proposition. This is especially for, to, to put the right message for the right buyer, and, and then how to pack package the right value proposition, how to implement a full commercial process, and then we'll go for a, a small session of Q&A and, and then draw conclusions. So, so let's get started with this. And the first, the first point today is going to be to establish the objective of the seminar. What, what are we supposed to end with? And we're going to cover three things. Number one, we, we need to determine what the real business opportunity is. Number two, we're going to review the, the stages of the commercial process to gain those business opportunities. And then obviously we're going to try to learn and, and, and try to sketch how to integrate that uh, action plan, that, that uh, uh, strategy plan to, to actually go forward. Our commitment, obviously, we will not rest until we accomplish the goal, and that's to land new contracts. That's, a, that's the main goal, and it is very important for us when we try to determine strategies to approach buyers, what is it that we aim for? And so, so this is to, something to have very, very clear, to land new contracts. That's, that's the main objective of this. So where do we find this, this opportunities? Let, let's get into it. And, and I wanted to show this map, especially because uh, for some years, uh, obviously, we've been attending different trade shows throughout the world. And, and usually we spend, I don't know, between 30000 to $50,000 in the lower range. To, to promote our company. And usually when we get back from those trade shows, we have, I don't know, between 100 and 150 business cards, but not necessarily will those be leads or potential buyers. That's just people that we met uh, at the trade show, perhaps marketing people that wanted to sell their products and services, and we call them leads, we don't know why. So, so we started attending different webinars and they said, if you want to uh, determine whether you should or, or not attend a trade show, focus first on the population growth and, and see what's going to happen in the upcoming years and try to serve those emerging markets where there is less competition. So that's exactly the map that I'm sharing on the screen right now, where we can see all the red dots and especially the, the yellow dots. The, the yellow dots are the emerging countries where there's less competition and obviously where all the international buyers are trying to get into, but they need to integrate their supply chains and they have right now no, no, no solid, solid uh, suppliers. So this is a very good business opportunity. If I were to choose between opening uh, right now a, a facility to, to get integrated into any supply chain versus the United States, I mean, be, between India or China or the United States, I would definitely go to, to the Asia side, and that's because of the emerging markets. It's a better opportunity. It's a larger market for the future, but, but most importantly, there's less competition right now, e even though the, there's a lot of companies, but there's less competition if we have very uh, solid information. So why is this happening? In, in this webinars that we attended uh, in, in the previous years, there's a, an international firm called uh, Frost and & Sullivan, and they're monitoring uh, 29 different uh, megatrends. And they said, focus on the populations that have over 1 million inhabitants of medium class and, and growing that, that are willing to spend in more things. So, so that's exactly the yellow dots that we're seeing on the screen. So right 
you know, if I was an international buyer, where, where would I try to uh, focus? Uh, uh, definitely on those uh, yellow uh, dots that we're seeing on the screen. Not the red dots, but the yellow dots. So once we have this clear, it, it, it'd be trying to understand which industry do I fit in? And, and, and that's what we're gonna cover in, in the upcoming slides. So the first one is try to determine where is the market for the future? That, that's, that's the most important thing. And then what's driving the demand? And, and, and I'm gonna give an example over here on the aerospace industry, and then trying to focus on what's happening in, in the international outlook. And as we can see, for example, the propensity to travel industrial populations is going to grow from 25% to 79, uh, 75%. And that's obviously because of those uh, medium class families that are going to try to visit their cousins or, or, or their relatives in a short flight that right now it does not exist. So, so if you see on the left side of the screen, we have the market drivers. And then on, on the Right side of the screen, we have the demand of aircraft to fulfill that demand that we have on the left. So this is just an example. This is not intended to be entirely airspace, but uh, focus on the market where we see the market drivers, and then on the right, we, we see the demand that, that is gonna be uh, derived from, from that. In this screen right now, what we're seeing is the outlook of that demand uh, isolated by, by regions. And the most important thing, we start to see uh, specific names of OEMs, the companies that are leading those supply chains. And it's, uh, this is very important, regardless of if you're in aerospace, in automotive, or anywhere that you, you want to serve a market, what you need to do is to determine first the, the region you're going to try to serve and who are the big OEMs, who are the big names that are leading the industry that, that you're going to try to get into. So once you determine those, uh, OEMs, it'd be a matter of trying to uh, find your position. We, we had a case in the past of a tier four that wanted to approach Airbus and they asked, asked us, can you introduce us to Airbus? And of course we can, but, but they are too high in the tree. They're, they're too, too far away from them. So uh, it, it'd be very important to understand the value chain where we try to get in and our place in the, in the value chain. So, so once we uh, understand the demand and who are the OEMs we're going to try to cater. Let, let's see different strategies on how to approach them. And we're uh, sharing over here four different stories. Obviously, we have a lot more. And, and what we've seen is uh, tiers one trying to look for suppliers in different regions. So, so, for example, we have the case of Orbital ATK. And they uh, invited to, to present to all suppliers a group challenge. So, so here's what they did. They integrated the, the challenge and, and they invited uh, suppliers to a meeting room and they said, this is what we're trying to accomplish. So once the suppliers could understand that, they prepared their presentations and even the tours that they made in, the, in, in their facilities tailored to, to meet the challenge that Orbit of ATK had. So it, it was a different approach in the sense that all the presentations that suppliers made were tailored to meet the challenge that Orbital ATK or this tier one was trying to, to accomplish. Then the second case we have over here, G Aviation Outdoors and Sleep Engine Project. And, and for this, uh, it was a very uh, interesting thing because they invited 10 different suppliers to compete for that project. And two of them were really good and what they did to, uh, to to, to uh, get, get the contract is they made a joint venture instead of competing against each other. And there was no one else to, to compete against the two of them. Then uh, Bell Helicopters, uh, this was a, another uh, supplier integration program that they did. And, and what they did is to integrate kind of a tier one. They were dealing with 65 different suppliers and they wanted someone to handle those 65 for them. So, so obviously they integrated demand and, and it was a, a an attractive business case. And last one is a case of uh, UTC. Basically, uh, what they've done is that they've, they've uh, and not only UTC, but different companies are kind of integrating even uh, an academy to train their potential suppliers. That's because of the demand that they have. Right now, their supply chains are capped. That means business opportunities. And if they don't train the new suppliers to come on board, that's not going to happen. So 
here are four different examples of what tiers one and OEMs are doing in order to, to integrate their supply chains. So basically, how, how can we uh, do this? Basically, we, we can get together with those OEMs. We, we can try to attend those supplier day workshops where we can learn, number one, about business opportunities, but number two, uh, on the methodology on how to become a supplier. There's different requirements, and, and right now there, there are lots of companies that are not ready and that they are not competitive, and, and so they need to learn. And that, that's why it is very important to try to identify who the OEM is. And once you identify it, then try to find your place in the supply chain. What, what is the component uh, system or part that you're going to try to manufacture? And, and, and then uh, to, to understand the sequence, what, what is it that you will need? And we will uh, discuss this further uh, ahead. One very important thing is uh, that the, in the old school, the, everyone was competing on an isolated way. And right now we need to work as a team. So this is an example of uh, tier two and tier three uh, companies. They got together, it was six different companies. And not only did they get together, uh, just to, to make an integrated presentation, but actually they got to, to make an integrated cost. So they had to open books. This slide that I'm showing on the screen, it took us about three months of work with this supplier, especially because they didn't want to open their books, uh, the, 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 their finance books, to see how much they were going to quote so that we can quote on an integrated basis. So, so finally, what we did is to... to uh, if you see over here, we have the raw material, we have the manufacturing side, which it was metal stamping and machining, and then the special process, secondary processes like anodizing and heat treatment. So we, we got together six companies, and we, we said, if we quote to, to a tier one, this is the integrated pricing that we would have. And to, uh, in order to gain trust, we said, you can hire any of the six companies and we'll uh, invoice each one of the other five uh, internally so that you don't have to deal with the six of them. So, so this was kind of an integrated approach to gain this contract and uh, the, the supply chain teams from both companies, Airbus and Ember, which were the target, were very pleased to see the, the integrated approach and integrated pricing. So it's a different strategy. And if you try to approach one of these OEMs, regardless of the industry, what we suggest is try to complement your capabilities with the, the, the other suppliers so that you can make a, a more integrated approach. Uh, so, so in order to fulfill this uh, first objective, which was determine what the opportunity is, here are the key questions that you should be asking yourselves. Number one, what regions will you focus on? Remember the map. So, so it, it's very important to determine which, which regions you're, you're going to be trying to serve. What specific OEMs would you want to serve or value chains? Then would you be interested in the manufacturing side or, uh, or, or on the MRO side? We'll, we'll, we'll discuss this in, in a bit or both. What type of value-added service are you willing to offer? We'll, we'll discuss this uh, further ahead. What type of machinery and equipment processes and certifications are you willing to invest in? And there are some industries that have entry barriers, for example, in the airspace. It takes perhaps about three to four years to, to get fully certified, to get the approvals of the OEMs, and to get a contract. The good news is that once you land a contract, for example, we work with uh, the big OEMs, with the big names that you saw on the screen before, and they said, we've been in the market for almost 100 years, and the suppliers that were born with us are still with us. So uh, th this is a very good industry. The good news, once again, is, is that once you get into those supply chains, if you are competitive enough and you have competitive approaches, like working in a team, you, the, the most likely thing to happen is that you will land long-term contracts. So, so what are you willing to invest in in order to, to get in? And what type of partnerships are you willing to make? Remember, the challenge these OEMs are facing. Obviously, most OEMs uh, uh, from uh, all over the world are very interested in what's going on in Asia. Countries like India, Malaysia, China, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, all of those 10 economies that are on, on that side of the planet, they're very interested. They've already gone there 
but they need their tiers two, three, and four to get aligned with them. We've uh, talked to different uh, VPs of supply chain on the Asian side, and, and they said, right now, I'm missing a lot of suppliers. Right now, I have to import everything from North America, Europe, or other countries. And, and it's a very high production cost plus lead time and logistics. So obviously, I have from here to 2024 to optimize those costs. So, so here's the challenge that they have. And the question is, are you ready for this opportunity? Uh, in the past, it, it, used not, it, it didn't used to be that way. So questions for your company again. What, what if you could increase your profitability by taking advantage of the Asian momentum at, at this early stage? If you recall the map, it was a forecast up, up to 2050. So if you get in right now, this is a very good opportunity. And right now, there are a lot of Asian countries that are offering a lot of incentives for your company to get established. What if you could become an international, international company instead of a local supplier? That, that's a very important thing. And, and to become an international company, all it takes is try to get into a value chain, a global value chain. And what will the opportunity cost be of not taking action now? We'll, we'll discuss some of these cases. Time is now. The Asian boom requires engineering companies to lead the way for the next 30, 50 years. International buyer companies will need local but world-class suppliers to sustain their growth. And when I mean local, that doesn't mean that if they go to India, they, they need a local company from India. They, they need a company that stays localized in their supply chain. That, that's what, what we mean by local. What differentiates the extraordinary company from the ordinary ones? Number one is the vision and commitment. What is expensive? Sometimes they say it's very expensive to get certified. It's very expensive to open a facility where the demand is. Well, actually, it's going to be more expensive to lose the opportunity if we think in the long term. And obviously, it's complicated. Sometimes it means speaking a language that is not your, your mother language. Sometimes it's understanding the, the loss of different countries, dealing with different uh, logistics suppliers. I, I, we, we totally understand. It's a whole different uh, world. But if we have the mindset of this, whatever it takes, uh, uh, mentality, we'll, we'll get there. And, and uh, an example that we wanted to share is 30 years ago, Singapore was a third world poor community. No skills, no technology, and see where it is right now. We had one supplier uh, from, from Asia that we took to ST Aerospace. ST Aerospace is uh, one of the largest MRO companies in the world. And when uh, the buyer was going through the capabilities and size of the company that we were introducing, he said, we want to ask you, why do you want this company to work for us? There are 46 employees. Uh, no, actually, there, there are 23 employees and they've been in the market for 46 years. Why have they not grown? What, what, what was wrong with them? And, and they said, look at us. We have only 19 years in the market. And in these 19 years, we're over 20,000 employees. We're one of the largest summer row facilities in the world. So what, what, what's wrong with them? And obviously, we, we do not see this type of growth all over the world. So, so getting back to the, the vision, what is the vision that we have for our company? If we were to think in the long term for the next uh, 30 to 50 years for our company, how big will it be? What type of supply chain do we need to get in? So where was your company 30 years ago and where will it be? Where will it be 30 years from now? Will your future self be thankful for the changes you're going to make this year? Well, we're, we're hopefully, hopefully the answer is yes. Uh, now, now let's see the, the full commercial process. In, in the past, we saw what the opportunity was bit of a mindset thing. And this is a very important slide that we're seeing on the screen. These are, these are the seven stages of the full commercial process. Uh, we're we're going to see each one of the uh, stages. And, and if you see, we have in the mid, and on the blue uh, ink, we have the task that we need to do. And on the green tab, we, we have basically the classification of the people we're dealing with. So what we need to do at stage one is identify the right buyers. These guys are going to be our subjects. So, so uh, and, and in, the, in the upcoming slides, we're going to see uh, 
how, how to determine who the right buyer is. Then we need to connect with them. Let's suppose that I say, I'm going to go after the wing fabricators, or I'm going to go after the automakers, or I'm going to go after the uh, car interiors makers, or I'm going to go after whoever. What we need to do is to integrate a list of those companies. And let's say that we have 100 companies listed over here. Then we need to connect with the right buyers. So what is the difference between a subject and a prospect? Basically, a prospect already heard our value proposition. That's the main difference. We already touched the, 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 the prospect. And what we need to do at stage two, once we connect with them, once we make a presentation, is try to ask for an RFQ. So, so over here, we, 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 when we are in the first interview, we need to determine that they, I, I, we, we change the acronym. It, it means the company, if it's the right company, if the person I'm dealing with has the authority to buy, if they need what I sell, that's what the N stands for. B stands for budget. Do they have a budget to buy what I, what I sell? And T stands for time frame. Do they have a time frame? for, for uh, buying what, what, what I sell. So that's exactly what a qualified prospect is. Uh, usually when people go to trade shows, they, they uh, talk to different people and, and they just say, well, I got a business card and this is a lead. Why, why is it a lead? Just because you made a presentation, that's nothing. We need to determine if they're qualified and this is a very good filter. A filter, once again, is if it's is the right company, is it the right decision maker, do they need what I sell? Do they have a budget to buy what I sell? And do they have a time frame to buy inferior to less to, 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 to three years? So, so the next objective would be to try to negotiate a, a PO. I, usually it is a trial PO in, in the aerospace industry. We call it the FIA. And that, that stands for first article inspection. And basically what we say is if we qualify with everything that the buyer needs, we're going to try to ask for a trial uh, purchase order so that we uh, deliver the first uh, products. Once they uh, see that, that we uh, are good, that then we need to obviously uh, finance deliver and invoice the client that this is when, when we finally have a client. Then it's very important to try to get repeat orders or to get a long-term contract. This is when it becomes a recurring client. And finally, the, the step number seven is to try to ask them for a referral. Uh, if they're satisfied enough, they're, they will recommend us to someone. So these are the seven stages. And let me be clear with this. Nothing is going to happen unless you have a trigger to go from one stage to the other. This is very important. Uh, one thing is just to imagine this. And another one is to picture this as a full commercial plan and say how will I integrate a list how will I connect with those buyers and that's where you determine the strategies we're gonna see those things right now how will I uh, get the RFQ how will I negotiate for the first uh, trial PO how will I deliver an invoice my client how will I get them to uh, sign on a long-term agreement and how will I get referrals so, so those are specific actions that we need to, to do and when something doesn't happen for example, let's suppose that out of those 100, in stage number one, we, we uh, got connected to 100 of them and no one became a, a qualified buyer. So what we need to understand is what was wrong. And usually it's one of these three M's that we have over here. If, if we don't have the right market, perhaps we're gonna, our, our results are going to be uh, very little. If we approach the right market, but we don't have the right message, that means we don't have the right value proposition, perhaps we're gonna lose that potential client. Or perhaps the media, the marketing materials or the marketing approach that we use. Perhaps we identify the right buyer, we have the right value proposition, but we approached a, a, a networking cocktail and it was not the, the, the best way to do it. So, so when something does, and work in the conversion rates from, from one stage to another. What we need to do is, is how do we make it different? And when we are going to make it different, it, it has to be in one of these three games. What do we change? Do we change the market? Do we change the message? Do we change the media? One suggestion over here would be do not change too many things at the same time because then you're not going to know what change made the difference. When, when you make a change, make 
just one single change and then go implement. And then if it didn't work or if you want to improve your conversion rate, then go back again and see what else you're going to change. And this applies to each and every one of these stages. So, so this is very important thing. Uh, to keep in mind the seven stages and how to uh, trigger, start thinking how to trigger the action from one uh, stage to another. These are the 10 elements that we need to, to integrate uh, to, to, to have our full commercial plan. And this is very important because I've seen companies and, and they, they just go uh, to try to find clients, but they don't have a clear plan. This is a very uh, uh, narrow, a very uh, laser targeted way of putting a commercial plan. Number one, you need to have a clear target market. So, so if I'm going back to the previous slide. Number one, identify the right buyers. That, that's exactly what this is. Then what is the value proposition that we have for this market? So, so we're, we're going to see examples right now, but, but this is very important. We have a very tailored value proposition. What's the sales objective? If, if we are going to serve this market, let, let's say that, that I put an objective and I say, with, with this campaign, with this trade show, I, I want to get five different clients. Okay, so what's the value proposition that I have and what's the sales objective? It's those five. What are the strategies that I'm going to implement to get to those five sales? And by strategies, I'm going to say, I'm going to go to uh, two different trade, trade shows and I'll, I'm also going to talk to the commercial aggregate of our country in, in, in India or I'm going to make a webinar or I don't know. Those are the strategies we're going to try to plot. And very important for each strategy, you need to put some accountability. If we say our sales objective is five clients, and I'm going to go to a trade show, the key question is okay, so you're going to go on how many of those five are you going to bring on board? Let's say two. Okay, so, so that's accountability. And obviously, we are putting an objective. That doesn't mean that, that it's going to happen, but at least we're going to measure it. And then we put the commercial process. And by this commercial process, what we mean is put the strategy in a step-by-step -step sequence. What do you need to do first? And then what, what, what are you going to do later so that you get to the final goal of getting a client? So this is identifying the full flow. And this number five is, I'm going to go back to the proof slide, is going along the seven stages. So that's, that's a full process. Uh, with specifics as to what what are the steps that you need to do, and then from point number six to ten is getting tactical. Is what are the tools that you're going to require for each one of the steps that you're outlining? So so if you say that the strategy is to put together a webinar, so what are the tools? You're going to need a presentation. You're going to need a, a webinar tool. You're going to need invites. You're going to need I don't know. So so you outline all the tools that you're going to require. Uh, to, to fulfill that strategy at that specific stage. So, so th that's exactly what you do for each one of the stages. What are all the tools that you're going to require? What's the key information that you're going to have for each one of the tools at each one of the seven stages? And this is very important because this is a part of the message that I was mentioning before. If you recall, we said market media, uh, market message and media. So here's a market, here's the message, and here's the message as well. And here's the media, the, the, the tools. Then the human resources, who's going to do what? There's going to be accountability for each one of the actions. And so when, when an action or when a process doesn't have an owner, it's not going to happen. So, so of every action that you outline over here, there's got to be an owner who's, who's going to be responsible for taking this uh, action. And, and then obviously you plot all of this in a calendar and you assign a budget. One very important thing, and this is a, a, for, for you to outline, if your uh, cost of acquisition, of, of client acquisition is more than 5%, you're doing it wrong. You need to bring it down to less than 5%. So, so the, the, those are international metrics. We didn't make it up, but, but, but this is very important. So, so when you say, I'm gonna go to a trade show and this happened to me in the past, uh, we started organizing, for example, seminars. We said we're going to attract uh, Canadian 
buyers. So, so we, we organized a, a, a seminar. This was a live seminar in Montreal, another one in Toronto. And we, 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 the way we did it, we, we used to do telemarketing. So I had a full staff attend, attend crew team, and they used to call during six months <coughs> different buyers to invite them to, to our seminars. And basically, to, to get 25 uh, qualified buyers or, or 25 buyers into that seminar, it was a very good event for us. We, we, we considered it a success. A success. <clears throat> the cost of organizing that seminar was around $50,000. So if we divide $50,000 by 25 attendees, it was $2,000 per person that, that we were spending. So, so the key question is how many of those 25 were qualified buyers? And we had only five usually. So $50,000 divided by five qualified buyers, each qualified buyers were, were costing us $10,000. So the key question over here is, can we make it with less money than that? And that's when we try to outline different strategies to get to the same objective with less budget. So it, it is very important to outline how much it is going to cost you to implement this commercial plan. And once again, track, I'm going to go back to, to this, track how much you spend for the whole uh, line until number five, which is when you acquire the client, and divide it by the number that you get at each stage. So, so if you know your number, and you try to plot a different strategy because someone said you should try webinars instead of going to, to a trade show. The most important thing is how many clients did you bring on board and how much did it cost you to bring the client on board? That, that's the whole objective of uh, integrating this commercial plan. So just 10, ten uh, elements along with this uh, uh, for a commercial process, a full seven stages, that, that should be the, the, all, all, everything you, you should focus on. So, so let's continue with this, and, and this is how do you identify the right potential buyers? I'm going to use an aerospace example over here. And as I said before, we need to identify the types of industry. This is when we say aerospace, well, well this is aerospace, military defense, commercial, business jets, and space. And then they, they also have two different sites. One could be manufacturing, and the other one could be the maintenance and repair and overhaul industry and it's a different bulking each one of them so, so we identify this and then we are going to identify where are we located what what where is our place are we at tier three are we at tier four are we at tier two where do we want to be located we, we just had an example a few months ago of someone who just bought a, a cnc machine and he called me and he said i want to become a tier one and i'm like no you can't i mean you're you uh, I applaud the spirit of you trying to become a tier one, but you need to understand the industry. With one machine and with no experience in the industry, right now what you can do perhaps is try to be a tier four. So, so it's very important to understand the industry, uh, which specific uh, line you're going to try to get into and your level in the supply chain. This is just an example once again in the aerospace industry, understanding tiers one. So when we break down the aircraft, these are the different parts that we get. And if you see over here, these are the companies that are doing uh, the, those parts, that are integrating those, the, those parts. And this was for the Boeing 787 model. So in the industry that you're in, once again, I invite you to do the same. Who is a player? Identify a model and then identify who are the tiers one that are uh, integrating this so that you can uh, outline that. Uh, this is another uh, part where we see each one of the companies that are, that are doing uh, different components from, from uh, each country. So th that's uh, the important thing about identifying who the buyer would be. Uh, and then what are the requirements that they will ask you? Because uh, the, they will ask you for NETCAP and AS9100. A a uh, that, that's in the aerospace industry. Uh, they, they will ask you for approvals from the OEMs and that you comply with uh, the, the EASA or the FAA. So in the industry that you want to get into, what are the approvals, what are the certifications, or, and what are the regulations that you need to comply with? And it is, it is very important for you to 
do this homework before you even try to travel to a trade show or visit a qualified buyer if you're not ready. So, so uh, the, this is uh, what, what, what they look for, and it's very important. Usually, a buyer is going to look for two things, readiness and competitiveness. If you're not ready, but you're competitive, or you try to prove that you're competitive, there might be a chance for you to be developed and coached along the road. If you are uh, approved and not competitive, they will try to understand why you're not competitive. And if it's because of cycle times, if it's because of, of a lack of knowledge of how to integrate a quotation, those are things that can be polished. That, that's why, why we exist in the industry. Then once you identify those things, this is a list, for example, of 180 companies. If you recall, at stage number one, we, we said, let's integrate a list. Well, here's a list. Here's a list of companies. It's 180 companies. This is just an example where we outlined the names of the uh, companies that we're going to try to approach. And, and after this, what we're going to try to do is to uh, get a list of who are the buyers that we're trying to, to get. Uh, then very important is who are we competing with? And, and the most important thing is not how much it costs me, but how much it will cost my client to acquire what I sell. Uh, and uh, if my client is in India and I'm in Saudi Arabia, uh, how much will it cost them to land the pro product that I sell in their facility at their door? So, so w w I need to think more on, on the uh, full side, which includes all of this. What am I offering in terms of quality, pricing, lead time, and turnaround time? Turnaround time, especially when there's uh, some rework. What are guarantees that I offer? What are payment periods or financing that I can offer? Logistics up to 3PL or even VMI. Uh, what, what are the customs and free trade agreements intelligence? So right now, there are a lot of free trade agreements signed all over the world. How much will it cost you according to these free, free trade agreements to deliver your goods to, to your client in India or China or Singapore? That's something that they ask you. And, and it's not, not only how much it will cost you, but also uh, how long will it take you? How long will it take you to clear customs? That, that's, that's important. And it's very important that you question this so that you can put all of this in the value proposition. Uh, note, there might be some potential uh, clients married to some specific buyers at corporate level. So, so if they already have a commitment, it's very important to try to determine this. So, so uh, this is a competitor analysis. And if you find someone better than you, perhaps you could be partnering with them. So how do we integrate the right value proposition? This is the right message. And these are the 10 different elements. Because of time, we're not going to have uh, time to go through 10 of them uh, in detail. But here's the 10 key things that you should outline in your uh, uh, brochures or your presentations. What are the products and services that you have? What are the quality certifications that you have, approvals and, and regulations that you comply with? And parts of the aircraft or, or, or of what you uh, uh, finish. Uh, for, for example, let, let's suppose that I do some machining, that's just, uh, the, the service that I offer. What are the end parts of the aircraft? Well, I, I provide machining parts for the seats. Okay, so, so that's the end parts. What are the, the certifications of uh, regulations? Once again, lead time and turnaround time. We, we already discussed that. Full service delivery. How will you deliver it, including customs, logistics, the 3PL, and VMI, what we were discussing? Testimonials is very important. They, they always want to know that you are not new in the market. So who, who, who have you worked with and what, what are their opinions in, in terms of you? What differentiates you from your competition? Guarantees, and this is very important, the FAQs and the SAQs. FAQ stands for frequently asked questions and shoot as questions. The, the frequently asked questions, if you try to remember everything all your potential clients have asked you, and you integrate that into your uh, documents, that's going to help them a lot. And the shooters' questions usually is, uh, let's suppose I say, here are the questions you should be asking yourself before you buy a, a car. So, so when you integrate those shooters' questions, you can strengthen your differentiators from your competition. So 
certain key elements that you should be considering to integrate your value proposition. I'm going to go quick through this, but, but still the, the presentation is going to be shared. So uh, I'm going to go quick with this. Uh, so the value proposition summary, now that you have gone through all the 10 elements to integrate your value proposition, let's try to put it a, a, as a script. So, so that's an example. Let's see, b, b Manufacturing Helps Airspace. And this is very important. This is the name of your company. In, instead of saying that I, I sell machining parts, it says this company helps airspace engine manufacturers serving Boeing 787 Nervous A380. If you see I, we're using key names with their high precision machine parts through or specialized fabrication services at or AS9100 certified plants at a very competitive total delivered cost, including, cost, including customs and logistics with a lead time of five days anywhere in Asia. If you recall, all the 10 elements are somehow embedded in this single uh, paragraph. So, so it is very important for you to, once again, go through 10 elements and determine how can we put a single paragraph where you outline those competitive edges over here. So the, and, and the most important thing, the value proposition is filtered by the what's in it for, for me filter. That's all the client wants to hear, what's in it for me. And then packaging the value proposition, once you have catered, once you have tailored your value proposition with the 10 elements that we covered before, it's just a matter of designing your brochures. And, and you put all these basic elements in, in, in your uh, brochures. Who are you, name of your company, what do you have for them, which is a value proposition? What's the processing which they can order what you sell? A success story, and then a call to action, which could be request a proposal or request a quotation. And then it's just a matter of determining the types of marketing materials that you're going to be using, where you're going to be plotting the value proposition that you have. Uh, this is uh, very important. There's ways to, to outline your your uh, uh, public your, your value proposition. I'm gonna go quick through this because we're running out of, out of time. Uh, align everything, and, and I, I've seen a lot of uh, suppliers that have a Gmail account or that have a Hotmail account. It, it, that, that's not very good in, in the corporate world. It, it, you should have your own domain name and uh, perhaps. Uh, use the language that their your, your client is going to, to, to sell uh, consider all of these items when you're trying to, to consider uh, being an international supplier as far as business cards i'm going to go quick through this this is apparently a, a simple business cards if you see it's my name the position that i have it's over here, the, the very clear types of industry that we serve. Obviously, we can serve more, but this is the target industries that we have. Uh, contact data, the, the type of services that we have, and all of those things are in the, in the front side of the business card. In the back, basically, we have a guide. So 3% of the buyers usually are the ones that are ready for me and my competition. The, the, the rest are going to be here that are not ready because they're missing information. So we create guides that they can download. And what that means is that I can attract those uh, potential buyers to my uh, marketing materials and know about my value proposition. So if you see, this is the back of the business card and it serves two purposes. The front is for those that are ready. The, the back is for those that are not ready, but I can capture in a different way. These are just brochures. The different showrooms, uh, the, the pictures, uh, uh, you've already seen uh, all of this. Once again, we're going to share all of this. As far as value proposition, it's very important. Uh, this is an example of an oil and gas company. And this oil and gas company had one single presentation for everything. What we did is uh, refineries think different than uh, oil wells. So if you see, it's very clear over here, the name oil getters. All wealth fog simulation treatment is very clear what they sell and the value proposition increasing at least 30% in all bar production in one day. It's measurable. In one single slide, you have the value proposition. Over here in refineries, it's using the terminology that they want to hear. Specialized services to increase pressure and temperature in process plants, eliminating toxicity and explosion limits in one day. That's the keywords that they want to hear. So if you see over here, 
it's same company, the same machinery and equipment, the same everything, but it's a different target market. So, so basically the value proposition has to change. That's an example in one single slide. So how do you implement all of this? Remember, we're going after the camped uh, uh, buyers, the, the right company, the ones that have the authority to buy, the ones that have a need of what we sell, the ones that have a budget, and this is very important. If they don't have a budget, don't waste your time with them. And the ones that have a clear time frame. This is very important. That's a qualified buyer. And uh, when, when you're going to implement, measure everything, everything. Like how much is going to cost you, and, and look, the basic math. How much it costs you divided by how many uh, clients is going to get you. And if it gets zero, don't waste your time or money. There are some magazines, there are some websites, there are some uh, places that, that they tell you, if you spent $10,000 with us, we're going to show your logo over here, which is going to be seen by 10,000 people. And I'm like, I don't care if it's not going to bring uh, qualified prospects. So you should be very straightforward with that. Uh, as far as communicating the, the right value proposition, so we, we hope that you select the right strategies the ones that you fully commit yourself with in order to get the client. If you are hesitant about a trade show or something that you're going to do, then either you experiment once and measure it or don't try it at all. The success of your business is, is um, uh, at stake over here. So uh, w one last strategy that we recommend over here is integrate uh, uh, free lectures, free presentations, such as one that we're presenting today. And when, we, when I try to do in the past the seminars that I told you in Canada, in the United States, and in Europe, what, what happened is that my cost was fifty to $75,000 per seminar. And usually I would get an average of 25 assistants. When I started uh, presenting uh, with other associations, the first lecture that I gave was before 30, uh, 1,300 manufacturers. There was no way that I could have done this on my own, but, but I leveraged on different associations. So this is a very good thing that you can do. And the best way to do it is to prepare a free lecture, to prepare perhaps even a, a book that you could publish. And, and the book should be a guide to solve a problem that your clients have through uh, using the service or, or products that you, you provide. Uh, to connect with... Uh, with every bit of a meeting, when, when you connect with them, you should have this and you should track it. What's the name of the company? Who's the decision maker that uh, we dealt with? For example, when you go to a trade show, what are the comments? What happened? Is there a business opportunity? And, and you put numbers to it. What are the next steps? Who's going to be in charge of it? And the next uh, date. The, the best tool to, to manage this is a CRM software. And, and then to, to get the RFQ, basically, I'm not going to go through this, uh, spending a lot of time, it'd be just ask for it. The best way to, to prove uh, yourself to a buyer is ask uh, for a, a, an opportunity and, and try to provide this. These are the seven things that your quotation should uh, include. Clear identification of the project to quote, uh, tailored value proposition, the account executive is going to be in charge of them, clear proposal with scope of work and responsibilities of each part of each party, the stages uh, for, for fulfilling this, investment and guarantees, and next steps. Once again, I'm going to be sharing all of this. To negotiate the PO, basically, it'd be just uh, following up. We, we, we've had a lot of uh, clients in the past that said, I just sent an email, and I didn't get a response back from the buyer. Well, you keep on insisting until you get the, the, the trial PO. That's very important. Follow-up is everything in sales. Uh, and actually, what I'm going to try to do is to fulfill uh, properly. If you want one uh, good suggestion, uh, under promise and over deliver. Under promise and over deliver. When you do this, getting a referral is very easy. Your clients are very satisfied with you. Uh, but usually it happens all the way around. People over promise and under deliver. So, so let, let's, let's make sure that you uh, uh, put the metrics for all of this. So, so we're closing this. And to, to, to close this once again is, Review your whole commercial process along the seven stages. If you're missing steps in what you do, make sure that you identify clear strategies to accomplish each one of them. 
at each stage, make sure you are uh, qualifying so that you can push them to the next stage. And if, if something is not working, see what, what's the right combination that you should be making. Is this the right market? Is this the right buyer? Is this the right message that I'm conveying? And is it the right vehicle? So, so the right media. Once again, market, message, and media. Very, very important. So I wonder if I feel here, uh, are there any, any questions? We've gone very fast through a lot of information, but I wonder if there are any questions in regards to uh, the, the, the full commercial process and what you could do. I'm going to mention some of the frequently asked questions. Uh, usually it's like, how, how do you determine who the right uh, company is? And, and uh, if you send me an email, it, it, basically I'm going to be sharing with you for free uh, the, the, the matrix that we use with training indicators that, that uh, is going to show you with the right op opportunity. Just to give you an example, we had a company that used to sell, that they said, we do contract manufacturing uh, of plastic injection and machining. And, and, and I said, for whom? And they said, for the medical device industry. And I'm like, that, that's too broad, too broad. I, I cannot make a campaign for them. So, so the, the owner of this company was like, how should, should I do it? And I said, well, let's go through the matrix. And first, let's outline all the specific uh, processes that you offer. And we got to a list of 10 different services. And then I said, let's go to the specific markets. When you say medical devices, I don't understand that. I understand medical devices of class three that go into the human body or, or that are to, uh, to, to fulfill the equipment of hospitals. So, so once you classify all of this, you're going to find different decision makers in different places. So it was a matrix basically of 10 different products times 11 different markets that's 110 niche markets that he was trying to serve so, so i said either you give me a budget to try to go after 110 uh, uh, niches or let's focus on your best opportunity and your best opportunity is try to find which one of the 110 uh, niches uh, offers you the best opportunity with less competition with more profit margins, with uh, less capital investment, that you can unfold your, your capabilities. Let's suppose that your client requires you to be in India or in China or in Singapore or elsewhere, that you could easily, easily replicate your operations. So it's 20, 20 different indicators that you assign values to it. And what we did first is we, we discarded uh, 107 so that we got the top three. And with the top three, still with soft data, we asked the owner, which one of these three uh, niches do you want to go for? And he said, well, niche number three is the reason why I founded the company. So, so we said, let's run some financial statements, some projections uh, as to if we implement the commercial plan that we just outlined for a year, what would the results be? And the difference between niche number one and niche number three, it was a potential of $10 million a year. That was the difference. So, so he said, well, but I'm still in love with the niche that I cater. And, and, and I said, well, I mean, it's your choice. You're the owner of your company. But, but if you want to make your company profitable, you need to move to the other side. And, and obviously, it was a hard decision for the owner. But, but once he, he went through the full uh, uh, the process of uh, finding the right uh, target audience, he, he was able to, to see the difference and to focus his company. Right now, this, this company sells four times more than, the, than when we met him. That's basically because he focused on the right opportunity. He started uh, implementing different campaigns for the different steps that we just covered today. And he started measuring. Measuring, and when they measure, this is very important. You, 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 you should use like a traffic light, a green light to repeat everything that you've, you've been doing that brings a good result, a yellow light, light for those processes that you're hesitant of taking out but have not proven themselves, and obviously a red light for those things you're not going to do anymore because they didn't bring any results. And finally, we, 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 we use a, a blue light as well 
for the new things? What are the new things you're going to uh, try for the upcoming uh, commercial plan? So these are key questions that I, we, we, we get all, all the time. Uh, I, I don't know. Is there any question that we have yes, uh, from the audience? Because we have like a Folks, uh, Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, folks, we are now open for question and answers. So if you have any questions, um, we are really pressed on time. So please put it in the question box or raise your hand if you want to talk directly to the speaker. So let me go to the question box. Uh, there are two questions already popped up. First one, short one. For negotiations, is it a good tip to consider hiring an uh, intermediary? Uh, sometimes that's a that's a very good question. Sometimes yes, uh, that that depends on uh, <clears throat> the the best way to do it would be to not have an intermediary. Would be to have someone in your team that speaks the language and has the culture. That would be definitely the best way. And usually buyers want to have uh, no no intermediaries. However, there are some other ways to, or so, some other uh, times in which the intermediaries have a lot of connections and and, and, and it's going to be faster to get in through them than not doing it. So, so it's a, it's a two road avenue that depends on, on, on the buyer usually. Uh, but, but I, I would suggest at the initial stages, use a rep, wh whoever that is an intermediary that can connect you, but, but you're going to try to uh, assess them and by assessing them. It'd be, like what's the success rate that they can uh, provide you with? It, it, for, for example, there are some intermediaries that have already controlled uh, uh, distribution channels and they can get you in very quick. And the most important thing for, for the initial part would be get in, understand the game, and then perhaps two to three years later, you get rid of the rep. Thank you very much. I don't know if that, that yes, we have another caller raised a hand. Let me go straight to Brother Muhammad Ismail. Uh, Brother Ismail, I'm trying to unmute. Yes, Brother Ismail, could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Yes, my name is Muhammad Ismail. I'm, I'm a service provider, especially in a mystery shopping provider. And my okay. question to Mr. Hurtado is, uh, my question is might be outside of your area of expertise but I'm sure I will benefit from your wisdom. Uh, so as I told you, I'm a service provider, and uh, my question is about how promoting a service is different from promoting a product, like you just uh, told us in the, this webinar. So my service is, or, uh, is already uh, targeting retailers from all, our, all around the world, those who have outlets here in the Saudi Arabia, yes. and they need, they need somebody to check if their, uh, if their uh, standards are being uh, met on the ground? Like, for the most part, I believe the sequence is it's be the same. If you recall, number one, it'd be identifying who the right buyer is. I'm going to go through the 10 very quick. You, you need to identify who, who the decision maker is for, for your uh, type of stores that you could do the mystery shopping for. So, so who are those decision makers? What's your value proposition? And the value proposition has to be measured in numbers, in numbers, something that you can uh, take to the bank account. If you tell me that you're going to charge me, uh, I don't know, five dollars for your mystery shopping services, and you're going to get me back a hundred dollars in return, that's twenty-five the investment that I make. That's a very clear value proposition. I'm interested. So, so it be catering that value proposition with numbers. Then putting a, an objective, like, like if you launch your commercial brand right now, how many clients are you trying to approach? Is it five, is it 10, or is it one with 10 different stores? What, what's the objective that you're trying to, to accomplish? Then what's the strategy? W which fairs are you going to go to? Or are you gonna do uh, telemarketing? Or are you gonna go uh, B2B meetings? So that's a strategy that you're going to use to get to those uh, 10 clients that you, 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 you could go to. And, uh, and and then it'd be uh, identifying all the steps of the commercial process on how, to, how you fulfill it. So basically everything that we covered, I would do exactly the same tailored to the type of stores that you are trying to get to and, and, and to commit and, and, and to offer your value proposition. And I think it's very important what you do.
Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for asking the question, Brother Muhammad Smile. Uh, and that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. So I really want to thank you, Mr. Otado, on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship for taking the time to deliver this webinar. We really appreciate that and uh, look forward to remaining engaged with you. So once again, thank you very much, Mr. Hortado. And, uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And, and uh, on the screen, you have my contact data. Should I be of any assistance, let me know. And um, if you want the, 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 the deck, I, I believe I'm going to send it to you as the, the coordinator. So, so you can distribute the presentation with whoever needs it.